it seems like all you hear about is discrimination. In fact, I haven't heard so much talk about discrimination since the 1960s. Interesting, since we have a black president. But let's talk for a minute about real discrimination. In a minute, you're going to hear from someone who's black and whose family moved into an all-white neighborhood in Waterbury and had a cross burned on their front lawn. Despite that blatant discrimination and attempted intimidation, Gary Franks went on to graduate from Yale, worked for Fortune 500 companies, and then made history when he was the first black Republican elected to the House of Representatives in 60 years. He was before J.C. Watts or any other conservative black Republican Did the discrimination end there? No, actually it didn't. But this time it wasn't white people burning a cross on his front lawn. It was the Congressional Black Caucus voting to have him leave their meetings because they didn't want to hear his views on welfare reform and other conservative topics. Now, despite the consternation of the Black Caucus, Gary Franks was the Republican chairman for the Task Force on Welfare Reform and wrote several provisions of the law, including the use of the debit card for welfare recipients, which dramatically reduced welfare fraud. Major sections of Mr. Frank's Urban Entrepreneurial Opportunities Bill was passed in 2000 as the New Markets Fund and was recently extended permanently by Congress in December. In addition, as Connecticut's lone member of the Armed Services Committee, Frank's delivered more defense contracts to Connecticut than any, ever before. This included the awarding of the Seawolf submarine, which produced thousands of jobs in Connecticut, right here in this district, for more than a decade. Frank's also secured orders for the M16 rifle for Colt Manufacturing, which helped to save that company. Mr. Franks, as chairman of the Defense Conversion Panel, secured $20 million for the demolition of a former ammunition factory in Waterbury, which allowed for the construction of Waterbury's major shopping mall, producing thousands of jobs since the 1990s. Uh, by the way, that was the first time defense conversion funds had been used to do a project such as that. Um, <laughs> And by the way, uh, not only was, uh, did he have a problem with the Congressional Black Caucus, but our office was uh, visited and picketed by uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. And uh, I had the uh, distinct honor of uh, dealing with Reverend Jackson and uh, engaging in a, uh, in a prayer ceremony with the Reverend where he, uh, where he prayed to the dear Lord that Congressman Franks would see the error of his ways. Uh, Gary served three times in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1991 to 1997. Then in 99, he founded and became partner in the public affairs firm Gary Alvin Associates, based in Washington, D.C. In addition, he has served as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and is currently a visiting professor at Hampton University. He is also the author of Searching for the Promised Land, an African American's Optimistic Odyssey in 1996. And his second book, With God, For God, and For Country, will be released this spring. In association with Wesley College, uh, he has formed the first conservative think tank at a college in the country led by a black conservative. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce my friend and former boss, Congressman Gary Franks. Thank you, Ted. Well, I'm old, folks, so uh, if anyone has to go to the bathroom, Raise your hand, or just walk out and go to the bathroom. It's almost my bedtime. And when I say that I'm old, I first ran for office when you folks had a chance to vote for me 30 years ago. You either voted for me, or you don't remember, or you didn't vote for me 30 years ago. 
30 years ago, I was the um, youngest person to run for statewide office at the time in Connecticut's history, when I ran for state controller. And I did well here. I did well in the eastern part of the, of the state. In fact, I, I remember telling my, at the time, girlfriend that I was going to Lisbon, Columbia, and Scotland. And she said, what? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 all in Connecticut, all in Connecticut. <laughs> So that was an interesting year, 1986, and that was my second time running for, for public office. I'm old, so as, as I said before, if any of you have to go to the bathroom, I do understand, and this is close to my bedtime too, so I'll try, I already ripped out one of my pages of my speech, so let's you know, I'll try to keep it somewhat short. Once again, I want to thank Jeff for those very kind remarks, just like I wrote them. <laughs> and, in fact, you left out a paragraph, but I'll go um, I want to also uh, thank Ed Munster, who I had a moment in Congress in which we called him Congressman Munster many years ago, and I, I deeply regret uh, the fact that he did not prevail or get another chance to prevail in the U.S. House of Representatives, because if he had, he would have won, because we had a majority in 1994. And if we had a chance to, as members of Congress, to exercise our right to vote for your representative in this district, he would have been your congressman. And that's a deep regret that I personally have today. Also, I want to thank, or at least say hello once again to a somewhat colleague of mine. I left, he came to Congress, and that is now the first elected in Stonington, that is Mr. Rob Simmons, Congressman Simmons. Good friend. And has contributed to my campaign, so I have to treat him nicely. <laughs> also, uh, I wanted to acknowledge another friend. He, he's not from the second district, but I consider him a dear friend as well. We ran in 1990 together, and we were fighting for RNC money. And I got more of it than he did. And if he had gotten more than I did, he probably would have beaten Rosa DeLauro. And that is former state senator. Tom Scott. I'm not sure if he's still here. If he is, I'd like him to stay. Yeah, I guess he is not here. Okay. Well, I want to also congratulate all the candidates that ran and all the folks who were elected at this cycle. I've always, yes. I've always said, I've always said that you cannot win unless you run. That's a pretty basic statement, but it's, it's the truth. And I know that because when I ran the first time, I'll never forget it, the state chairman at the time, and I know JR's not here, and I won't mention this person's name. You know, he said, you know, it's gonna be kind of hard for you. And this is, once again, I'm old, folks, I'm old. This is back in the 80s. He said, it's gonna be kind of hard for you. I said, well, why? He said, well, you're black. I said, yeah, I've known that for 37 years. He said, you don't understand, you don't understand. Uh, white people aren't going to vote for a black guy. In fact, I want you to campaign only in New Haven, Hartford, Bridgeport, Waterbury, and you... I said, well, there's 164 more towns. You stay out of those towns! How don't you go to those towns? We'll take care of those towns for you! You just go to New Haven. <laughs> so you know what I did? Just the opposite. I went to Old Lyme, I went to Westbrook, I went to Lisbon, I went to Columbia. And in 1986, I led the ticket. I received more votes than any other Republican that ran in 1986. That was 30-something years old. 31, 32 years old. And that loss was one of my biggest victories. Now, I, I know I'm tired, but I, what I just said was accurate. That loss was one of my biggest victories. Because in that loss, I actually won the 5th Congressional District. So, four years later, I was able to tell the delegates, the folks, I already did this. I won the 5th Congressional District. Did the other four people win the 5th Congressional District? So that compelling argument allowed me to finish fifth, or walk into the convention in fifth place out of five candidates. 
You're supposed to chuckle on that one. Because <laughs> after all, the story has a happy ending. I won. <laughs> so obviously, uh, for many, many years, I've been told that uh, you know, white people just wouldn't vote for a black person. And then the person had the nerve to say something that even was even more profound than I think he thought it was profound. He said, you know, it's even worse for you. I said, wait a minute, you just eliminated 90% of the population. How can it be any worse? And he said, well, you're a Republican. <laughs> and black people aren't going to vote for you. So good luck. He said, well, you eliminated about 100% of the population. I guess I'm going to be well wrong. But I knew, I knew that was this false statement. I went to Sacred Heart High School in Water Bridge, the Sacred Heart alumni is looking at me right now. Sacred Heart probably had about four blacks in the school and about a thousand. All the blacks were on the basketball team or football team. <laughs> I went on to be class president of that school. So I guess I got a lot of votes from the things like When I was fortunate enough to go to Yale University, I was able to get in and, and be part of a number of organizations. So I knew throughout my life that white people are not going to just judge you because you're black. I knew that before. In fact, my son said, oh, you know, my, my son was laughing when, when Obama was, everyone was bragging about Obama carrying Iowa. You know, white people, only poor black guy. It's like, my son said, what? <laughs> People in Connecticut were doing that for you know, 30 years ago. And if other states had the opportunity, quite frankly, Jesse Jackson won Connecticut when he ran in the primary. I know I should mention that name since Jeff mentioned me. The, <laughs> the bottom line of it is I knew that for, for many, many years. For many, many years. So it was not, never a surprise for me to, uh, to see that occur. But I do congratulate all the folks who got elected, and especially those who, who ran, because, um, you know, you're going to lose sometimes. I've lost a number of elections, and once again, uh, it can lead to bigger and better things. You can clap on that, that's true. <laughs> you know, years ago, I used to always use a one little sheet like this and uh, it'd have a whole lot of things on it. But the problem that I have today is that I'm writing the same way. But I can't read it! <laughs> it is too small. <laughs> so it's a speech may be a lot shorter than I even thought. <laughs> I'm going to skip the part here. No, um, I've, been, I've been very blessed on a, on a serious note, folks. I, I, uh, you know, I can't say like Obama, my father, went away, or like Ben Carson, I never knew my father. No, I had a two-parent household. I was very blessed. I had a father who worked his heart out to support his six children. I had a two-parent household. I had a mother that worked hard at Waterbury Hospital as a dietitian. And back in the day, that's the way it used to be. You had more two-parent households. I had four or five siblings, and my mother always believed that the more you give, the more you receive. Treat others like you would like to be treated. Put God first and be thankful. And if you have a problem with anyone or any situation, look in the mirror. Don't be blaming other people. Don't be blaming the Congress for not passing my bills. No, look in the mirror. And my parents were able to, I'm the black sheep of family, if you didn't notice that or didn't understand that. Already. You, no, wait a minute, that, that's a serious note. You're going to see that in about 30 seconds when I tell you about my siblings. I have three sisters who hold doctor degrees. One a professor, one a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia. One taught many years at Temple University. And another would be a recovering attorney. <laughs> he has a JD, so we can My brother, a retired colonel. My other brother, a 
and successful school teacher and, and softball coach at Ansonia High School. So yes, I'm the black sheep of the family. In fact, up until I got elected to Congress, my mother kept saying, when are you going to go back and get another degree? <laughs> so, and as Jeff had alluded to, yeah, I, I've, I've seen racism. It's not, you know, it's, it's something that that is alive, and there are sick people out there, but there, there's so few. When I, that cross was burning in front of my yard when I was only 11 years old, I never forget going up to my mother and, and saying, you know, oh, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> you know the, the way I found out was I went outside and I saw this cross that, that stood about eight feet tall that was partially charred. So I went back inside and asked my parents, uh, I've seen that, but I've seen it only on TV. <laughs> What happened? And they said, oh, some crazy people decided to, to burn a cross in front of right here. Almost every night, we got threatening telephone calls from the Ku Klux Klan. And then they decided to shoot our dog on our lawn. <coughs> well, the police came out and said, well, they probably mistaken it for a reindeer. <laughs> and then one night, I, one day, I went to the mailbox. And I opened the mailbox. And in the mailbox was a dead possum dripping in blood in a white sheet with a cryptic note saying, now I won't use the N-word because I'm being taped, <laughs> but the N-word, and you will be like this dead possum if you do not move. We are going to blow your house up. Now, that happened to be a blessing in disguise because when you tamper with a mailbox, it's a federal offense. So the Waterbury Police Department, and I'm not showing any disrespect, their idea of protecting our family was to drive by our house twice a day versus once a day. <clears throat> when the FBI got involved, they got involved on a Friday. It was over on Monday. The episode started on Halloween night and went on until almost January. Um, so, you know, we, I know that there are people out there that are sick. When I ran and when I got elected, during the course of my campaign, believe it or not, the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan resided in Shelton, Connecticut. He said that he, was, he would move if I got elected. Yeah. Well, he moved. <laughs> Now, I strongly believe that if the Republican Party is able to get 25% of the black vote in this upcoming election, uh, we will have a Republican president. And I believe that black people are really sitting there saying, Republicans, reach out. Reach out, please. We have historic unemployment for the African-American community. And if you are a teenager and you're black, oh, it's, it's even worse. The poverty levels for black individuals are at historic highs. Historic highs. The graduation rates for, for black individuals are at historic lows. The segregation, now yeah, this is using a word from the 60s, is, I believe, that as bad, if not worse, in some areas than it was when Martin Luther King was alive. These are bad times for, yes, for America as a whole, but as they say, when some one group of people sneeze, the other group of people can catch pneumonia, well, the black community has really, really suffered, and they're waiting and hoping that Republicans will reach out and offer some solutions. I, I believe that some of the Solutions are common sense. You can't participate in half of the process and expect to get an A. Now, I'm a college professor now at, at Hampton University in Georgetown. If, if my students showed up for half of my classes, the best they could do is get a 50. And that's not passing. So if blacks feel that they can just stay in one party and expect the system to work for them, they're kidding themselves. It does not work for anybody if you participate in half of something. It's common sense. 
Also, if you walk into a gymnasium and wanted to have a pickup basketball game, if nine people join one team out of ten people, you can't play basketball. It doesn't work. So part of this is just plain and simple common sense. And that has to be underscored in the black community. So they, in the black community, would have to look at themselves and say, well, what are we doing wrong? Well, you're not playing the game right. If you, you expect to get an A and you show up half the classes, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. And believe me, Dr. Martin Luther King did not expect black people to participate in half of the political process. He didn't fight for that. He didn't fight for black people to say, oh, I want you only to participate in half of it. <laughs> no. He wanted us to participate, the black community to participate in the entire process. And we, and black people, have to recognize that. That it doesn't work if you don't. Now, to a certain degree, Don't you have having difficulties, folks? <laughs> to a certain degree, you have to really look at, your, look at the situation from the perspective of maybe the black leaders are actually hurting the black population. Now, I'm going to give you five examples. Five examples. One is on the issue of the issue of voting rights. Okay? Now, everybody's eligible should vote once. <laughs> Got stress down from Waterbury. Got stress down. But once, okay, everybody. But it's not a big issue to be talking about constantly like the Democrats are. Why is it a big issue? Because more black people voted percentage-wise than you guys, the white people. Did you know that? More blacks voted in the 12 election and the 08 election than white people. In raw votes, more blacks voted in North Carolina than white people. So where is the voter suppression? If it's historic levels, is that historic levels of black people voting? Where are the, where's the problem if it's at historic levels? There is no problem. The problem is, one of the problems would be, you must have a picture. ID. If you can't get on a plane without a picture ID, you should not be able to vote for the most powerful person in the world without a picture ID. Now that's the voter suppression. Oh my God. Give me a break. Then don't fly again, okay? Because that's flyer suppression, okay? What is that? Don't fly again. Please don't fly again. So, that is the wrong action. Now let's go with no action. That's number two. We've all witnessed over the last year, 18 months, Trayvon Martin's situation in Florida, Tamar Rice's situation in, in Cleveland, two black youths, one 12 years old, the other one walking from the store back to his house. And in both instances, at least at this stage, the people involved are walking the streets of America. Now, back in 1991, when I was in Congress, I remember looking at a video, probably the first time that we saw a video of this kind, when a guy by the name of Rodney King was getting the you-know-what beaten out of him by about five police officers. I think everyone would remember that situation, no need to show hands. <laughs> it, was a, it was a deplorable situation. It was, it, was it was very sickening to see that happen. There, were no, there was no audio. Riots took place in Los Angeles, and I was called over to the White House immediately. <coughs> kind of irritated the congresswoman that represented that district, but that's another story. Maxine will go over it. <laughs> and so uh, I was there at the White House, and the president had many of his cabinet members there. And you also had the NAACP chairman, you had the, the Urban League chairman, you know, all of the black luminaries were there. 
And I'll never forget this moment, because George Bush was very upset at what happened to Rodney King, and the verdict was not guilty in the criminal, in the criminal case. And I'll never forget the moment. He looked over at the Attorney General, and he said, I believe we should go after these guys on civil rights violations. And guess what happened? The Attorney General went after those guys on civil rights violations. Now, in that type of case, you don't need a unanimous decision. It's just a simple majority. And three of the five police officers were convicted of civil rights violations. Now, needless to say, I haven't seen that with our current president. I saw a president, I was in the room when the president said, I think we should do this, Attorney General, and they did it. My argument would be, would we have all these other situations that Trevon Martin been handled in this manner? We know that Zimmerman used comments that can be deemed as being a little bit racial. We know that. We have far more evidence, or at least an equal amount of evidence, in this situation, the Zimmerman situation, than we have in Bradley King. But all we hear about is these investigations that lead nowhere in civil rights, with a black president, a black attorney general, so no action is also something that I believe many people in the black community are kind of sad by, saddened by. The third would be, and this is somewhat controversial, especially in, in Connecticut, but that is uh, the abortion issue. Now I have, and this is my, the, the only votes that I really, truly, truly, truly regret, and I know it's going to irritate some people in this room, but Ever since I left Congress, I became very strongly pro-life. And I believe that in the, in, the, in the black community where the abortion rate is extremely, extremely high percentage-wise, that too many black leaders are supporting this, this, this activity. And when you read the history of Planned Parenthood and how the person who founded Planned Parenthood was targeting black people, how can you continue to support that organization? Yeah. And then, the fourth one would be confusing action. I'm just confused by it, really. Now, black leaders can send their children to the school of their choice, but they won't allow the poor black children to go to the school of their choice. Does anyone understand? Does anyone understand how it's good for black leaders but not good for the constituents? I, I, I just, it's just baffling to me how they can talk for like 20 minutes to explain why this is good for black people, that they can't go to the schools that they send their kids to. <clears throat> Makes no sense whatsoever. Brown versus the Board of Education was all about desegregating schools. How do you best desegregate a school? Magnet schools, charter schools, and school choice. We don't want forced busing. Forced busing is going to be a disaster and brought white flag and, and economic uh, problems for a number of locations around the, around the country. So how can, oh I know why, because the NEA gives black politicians a ton of money every single year. And if any black candidate talks about school choice, they become a target. Now I wonder if they read the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Because we should be fighting to desegregate schools. Many of our urban schools are more segregated today than when Dr. Martin Luther King was alive. That's a fact. And we're sitting with a black president and black attorney. So there are opportunities for the Republican Party in this upcoming cycle. Now, the, the last one, the, number five, not the last one, I got another page to go. So <laughs> I get too happy and if you get a little nervous, I said the bathroom's over there, go ahead, I won't be offended. And that is 
selfish action. Now, I fought against racial gerrymandering districts. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous to try to pack all the blacks you can in one district in order to get a black person elected. I said, well, I'm in a 4% black district and I won. Uh, got it? And guess what, folks? We've had five other re black Republicans in the Congress since I left. Five. One's in the United States Senate. And the Democrats need to hear this. Most of the growth of the black caucus, as far as their numbers, have come from majority white districts represented by a black person. So I hate to say I was right all along, but I was right all along. <laughs> They're very selfish. Oh, God, I am as long as we get elected. You know, right. Why do you want to vote for me? Right, right, right. <laughs> so, I'm not going to say in conclusion because you get too happy and you think I'm almost finished. <laughs> but, it was mentioned that I'm starting a, we have a think tank at Wesley College and we're, we're actually trying to um, formulate as many ideas as possible that we can share with the public, especially with our candidates that are that are running for president, who the nominee may be. And I just wanted to share a couple of points with you now. I had 17, but since it's so late, I'll just do about three or four. <laughs> and one will be on, on education. And, and, and to me, it's, once again, I don't think a lot of these problems are all that complicated. If, if you have a problem in school, if your child is having a problem in school, typically what do you do? Now this is not a difficult question, because many of you have done this. I know I've had to do it with one of my children. You get a tutor! <laughs> right? You get a tutor. You give them extra help. You don't need to go through all these generations. If a person had a tutor, I had tutors. Now, I was fortunate enough, as I said before, to go to Yale, not because I was all that smart, is because I had a tutor when I was five years old. Now, how do I have a tutor when I was five years old? Well, my oldest sister, the one that we taught at UVA, was 18 years older than me. So when she was teaching elementary school, I was going to get the same material. I saw what the teacher was going to teach the next day. I was ready. I was like, hey, I know that already. I know that already. I had a tutor. With the technology we have today, we get help hundreds of thousands of, of, of black, brown, yellow, white youngsters with their education via having some form of a tutor. Very simple, not hard. Now, the process in which we do this and actually pay for it is what we're working on as a think tank to make sure that it does not cost any taxpayer one nickel, and to make sure that we're able to offer this opportunity to every person in need. But that will, will help solve our, educational, our education problems, because once again, if you have a tutor, like I have two tutors, oh, I forgot, I have two tutors. The one who was at Temple is 16 years old than me. So I had two tutors, so when one was busy, I had another one right there in the house. How can you not get good grades if you have a tutor, folks? I mean, you really think about it. If you got someone giving you the material before you go to class, <laughs> come on, you can get, everyone can get that. And believe me, in certain areas, they have that. Believe me, in certain areas, they have that. Another point. Now, I remember when I was growing up in Waterbury, we had a and I said before, my father and mother, we took in everybody. I mean, you know, we had only five rooms. Okay, you already know I have five siblings, right? So I got five rooms. This is the little apartment. Five rooms, mother and father. That's seven, right? No, that's eight. I'm like, can't even count, see? That's eight. And then we always had a cousin or two staying with us, okay? They came up from North Carolina. They were, you know, they came up to get a job in the brass factories in Waterbury. So that's... That's 10, right? How many rooms are there? I said, five. Yeah, that's, a, that's, about, that's about right. <laughs> so we had, in fact, I used to ask my mother, where did I sleep back then? She said, you slept, obviously. You grew up. <laughs> so yeah, that's true. 
But my father said to my one of the my cousins who came up from North Carolina, he said, You got you have three choices about jobs. Three choices. You can go to college and I will pay your tuition to go to college. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, my father said, but we'll make it work. That's your first choice. Second choice would be you can get a job. And I don't care if it's a garbage man. My first job was cleaning toilets, mopping the floors at Waterbury Hospital at the age of 16. It allowed me to have a little tell you what, many years later when I went to college. Loved it. Well, I didn't really love it. I love the check. <laughs> the third choice that my father gave my cousins was go to the military. So, I don't know why we're not using that same approach with our young people in our urban areas, many of which are in poverty today. Do they know about that third option? Because obviously we want a strong military. If a person has graduated from high school and would like to serve this country, we should be applauding that. Yeah. And then after they leave, they have, to be, they have a number of benefits that will help them advance their career. They can, they can have the, the, the resources to be able to go to college without going to mommy and daddy. I haven't heard that option being on the table. It's either go to, no, well, you don't use that option. Say, which, which gang are you going to join? But that option should be on the table and should be talked about more. My nephew did it, and he was sitting around his grandmother's house, he was sitting around, sitting around. I said, well, what are you going to do? Nothing. I said, wait a minute, this nothing thing doesn't work. You know, there's, there's nothing, you don't see anything. Nothing is like nothing. I said, you gotta do something. And you can't just lay up here in your grandma's house. This is my mother, my mother in law's house. And so, one day he said, you know, Uncle Gary, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm joined the Air Force. I said, well, that's really good. And he's had a great career in the Air Force. He was up in South Dakota for many, many years was on the verge of making a career and turned his whole life around. That option hasn't even been talked about that much anymore. And it should. Now, I'm not, and Dad wanted me to take questions and answers, but I think you guys are pretty tired for that. I don't think that's necessary, <laughs> quite frankly. But, you know, I'm not going to talk about any candidate for, for president, per se, you know. You know, I started out in fifth place, there are five candidates, and I got the nomination. Anything can happen in this, this cycle. And that's, that's the way politics would work. But I, I must say that my students at Hampton were very insightful on this immigration, illegal immigration question. And they said to me, yeah, kind of frank, yeah, I, this immigration thing, I don't understand it, you know. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, bottom line, if someone would sneak into a movie theater, what would you do? What would happen to that person? And then another kid raised his hand and said, he would go to jail. He'd be black. I said, well, okay, okay, I'm not. I said, yeah, I said, okay, maybe that's true. But I said, at the very, very least, they shouldn't be allowed to stay and watch the movie. <laughs> into a movie theater, he would go there. If he snuck anywhere, he would go to jail. Simple, plain and simple. No one would say, well, nice that you're here, young man, and hope you enjoy the movie. And you want popcorn? It's run right out of the road. Don't get it. You have all the benefits you want. No one would say that. No one would say that. Eisenhower wouldn't say it either. They should have to get out of the movie theater, get at the end of the line, or the ticket line, and buy the ticket. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. There's a process, everybody knows it, and everybody must use it. Period. Now, I'm going to conclude. Yeah, I have the end of I wrote it down here saying that way, but I'm concluding that. So. I did write a second book, and it's coming out pretty soon, and, and it's, 
you know, you heard the title, so obviously it's, it's religious based. And I, and I, and I kind of talk about one theme. Not that my, my first book was too, Searching for the Promised Land. And this theme is really on our, our Ten Commandments. And that's something that all the major religions follow, the Ten Commandments. And I think that when you look back, some of you are almost as old as I am. <laughs> and you will remember the Connecticut Blue Laws. The Connecticut Blue Laws, picture, for some of you who are as old as I am, and some of you will like to picture you as old as I am, imagine back in those days when on Sunday you did not go to a mall. You could not. You did not go out to all these stores. You just could not do that. We have a society in which we honor the Sabbath. We spend time with our families. We entertain ourselves with our family. We got to know our wives and our children. <laughs> what happened back then? Well, we had more two-parent households back then. We had fewer divorces back then. We had a healthier America back then. And we never lost a war. Never. That's the fact, folks. We never lost the war. Because for some reason, we were following God and God led us. And we just always, whether you're Ike, whether you're Roosevelt, we made the right decision all the time. And we were invincible. Today, our current president can't figure out how many troops to send to war. No less how to win a war. They're well, on the one hand, maybe you should do this. And it changes every second. So I truly believe that part of our great greatness will come from our ability to go back to our roots of, of, of really being the country that the Puritans and the Pilgrims and our founders truly established and allow us to be invincible, where we never lost a war. Now, Vietnam, right after that period, when the, you remember when the Blue Laws ended, what happened? It must have been Vietnam War, we got all these other conflicts, and we went all crazy, and now it, it's a mess. We've been in, this, we've been in Afghanistan, you know, 15 years. I mean, it's been really, really bad. And I think that a nice, simple change of our adhering to the Ten Commandments, and one that we kind of struggle with, I mean, today, we cannot even have Thanksgiving Day with our families before they tell us to go out to the mall. We can't even have one day as Americans to say thank you to God for all of our blessings without it being interrupted. And we take it. We should be protesting. We should be saying to Walmart, hell no. No stopping on No stopping on Thanksgiving Day. We want to say thank you. You can do whatever religion. Let's say thank you to God one day as a nation. Oh, by the way, we've done this forever. You're the ones changing it by saying, oh, let's add this super. We started at 1201, then it moved to 4 o'clock in the morning, then it moved to 6 o'clock, now it's out after dinner. Pretty soon they're going to forget the day we told them. They say, hey, before you go to cook that bird, let's get to the mall. <laughs> That's next. And we're taking it. And we wonder why the indecisiveness of our leaders. We wonder why it seems like we're not going in the right direction. I strongly believe, and this is what my book will talk about, that it's because we have strayed and we do not allow God to lead us. And all God would ask is for us to abide by the Ten Commandments. After all, Moses had it pretty easy over Pharaoh. Seemed like he made all the right moves, even when he went to that water, and the water was there, but he made all the right moves, and what did Pharaoh do? All the wrong moves. I let Moses go, okay, and now I'm going to go after him, okay, and now I'm going to follow him to the water. Uh, that move, his last move. So I think it's pretty clear, when you go back to the first part of the Bible, or you go back to, or you go to today, to 2016. Those who follow God just seem to have things work out. Oh, no, excuse that. <laughs> seem to be okay. Um, seem to have a lot better than those who do not. So on that note, folks, 
I want to thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in Eastern Connecticut. And I, once again, I, I thank you for the invite. As you can tell, I'm a rusty politician. And uh, I had some jokes to tell you, but I, I hope that I've entertained you enough during that, that last, hopefully only 20 minutes or so. And I want to thank you, and may God bless you all. Gary Franks. And uh, we, we thank you all. The we thank you for the tickets. I think we did well. Thanks. The, uh, the results are being posted on the board as we speak. To find out what the numbers are, you can just go and take a look and uh, verify your number with the lovely ladies in red, and you can walk away with your basket. A couple quick announcements. I just wanted to indicate that in, uh, this very town you're standing in, in Norwich, the Republicans took over the city council. They kicked. And, and they did a good job, too. Because that's how you keep the seats. You get in and you do a good job, and I know you're going to. Also in Griswold, in Griswold, um, Kevin, uh, Kevin Schoolchuk was the was elected as uh, first elected. He was actually endorsed by the Democrats too. He was endorsed by both parties, the first elected, and um, so he got in, sit right over there. Now, he's just going to have to do a good job, right? Well, thank you much for coming in. Check your tickets at the, at the, uh, on the sign over there. I can announce them, though. Number one, movie time is one nine zero.